Welcome to yet another episode of the Sukunia Research Cast. I'm Chaitanya Sharma, and I'll be your host for this research cast. I hope you've enjoyed our previous research casts, and we are sure you'll look forward to more of these. We'll be discussing some staggering zero days, a vulnerability affecting a range of virtualization products, and other interesting facts. With this initiative, the Sukunia Research Team. Aims to bring to the viewers the most interesting ongoings of the security industry from the past quarter. The research casts are held quarterly to convey the plethora of information that we gather on a daily basis. The Sequoia research team over the years has gathered some insightful information about vulnerabilities and trends. We harvest this very information and will bring it to our viewers via the research casts. In each research cast, we'll discuss zero days. evolving trends and other interesting things we'll also talk about most interesting vulnerabilities that were discovered in the past quarter in this webcast we'll cover the vulnerabilities discovered in the second quarter of 2012 that is from april to june we'll note the trends that evolved during that period we'll also discuss the zero days and the most interesting vulnerabilities discovered during this period We'll briefly inform you about what the latest version of Sekunia's PSI does for you, and finally, we'll talk about the Sekunia Vulnerability Coordination Reward Program, or SVCRP, which has become increasingly popular among security researchers. In this section, we take note of the changes in trends of reported vulnerabilities. Over the past few months, we have indeed noticed some changes in the types of vulnerabilities reported. In the past year, we have seen an increasing number of vulnerabilities being reported in SCADA products. For those of you new to this, SCADA stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition Products, which monitor and control industrial, infrastructure, or facility-based processes. An example of a SCADA product could be a system to monitor a water treatment plant or a gas supply plant. SCADA systems are increasingly being used in various industries, and concurrently. Vulnerabilities reported in them are also increasing. Security researchers are becoming interested in and focusing more on finding vulnerabilities in SCADA products. In the past, we have also seen attacks on certain SCADA-based infrastructures using zero-day vulnerabilities. This puts a lot of pressure on the manufacturers to become more responsive and coordinate the vulnerabilities with their researchers. U.S. Cert's Industrial Cert branch. Known as ICS Cert, which handles incidents related to SCADA products, has been very active in identifying threats arising from security issues and coordinating these issues with the vendors. This is a noteworthy trend as more and more researchers have started focusing on a different segment of products to hunt for vulnerabilities. Since April this year, Adobe has shifted its path cycle from quarterly to monthly. Since June 2009. Adobe had adopted a quarterly security update cycle. However, in April they changed their model to coincide with Microsoft's Patch Tuesday. Adobe will now release their security updates on the second Tuesday of every month. This shift in the patch cycle model from Adobe will also make it easier for system administrators to patch their systems all at once, rather than having to patch systems at different times. System admins will now be able to update the systems with patches from two major vendors without incurring unnecessary downtime. This is a welcome change, and it needs to be seen if other vendors will also follow suit. Along with discussing ongoing changes and trends, we thought it would also be interesting to discuss a change in trend we would like to see. In March and April this year, we saw active exploitation of a Java vulnerability. Primarily on the Mac OS platform, versions prior to Java version 6 update 31 were affected and exploited by a malware. The malware used a drive-by download method, which means rather than a user downloading the malware, it installed itself by exploiting a vulnerability. Some statistics reveal that over 500,000 Macs were affected by this malware, which is a considerably large number. One of the primary reason for the widespread infection was that there was no patch available for Java on the Mac OS platform. While Oracle had issued the Java update in February, 
Patches were not available for macOS till April. Users using macOS were left vulnerable for over a month while active exploitation of the vulnerability was prevalent. Apple only released a patch for the vulnerability in April, much after the infection was detected. We would definitely like to see a change in trend here when it comes to vendors issuing patches for known vulnerabilities. This quarter saw four zero days being acknowledged, three of which belong to the same vendor. In May, Adobe patched a vulnerability in Flash Player, which was being actively exploited in the wire. This, according to reports, was a targeted attack against companies that function as contractors to the defense industry. The malicious flash file was embedded within an MS Office document, well, specifically a Word document, and was sent over email to the victims. The cause of the vulnerability was an object type confusion error when handling an underscore error response from an RTMP server. A malformed underscore error response could then be used to corrupt memory and execute arbitrary code on the affected system, resulting in a system compromise. The remaining three zero days affected Microsoft products. The first zero day was acknowledged by them in their April patch update. The MSCOM CDL ActiveX control, or the Windows Common Controls, provides easy to use controls for the GUI, helping developers implement controls, example, a list view control or a grid box in a hassle-free manner. This control is bundled with a large number of Microsoft products, including MS Office, SQL Server, Commerce Server, Visual Basic, and Visual Fox Pro. One of the methods exposed by the ActiveX control was vulnerable to a stack-based buffer overflow, which could result into a system compromise. Microsoft reported that the vulnerability was being exploited in the wild primarily via malicious MS Office files. The exploit code was embedded in an MS Office document and opening the document would instantiate the vulnerable control on a local system. This vulnerability is particularly interesting due to the large number of applications affected by it. Exploitation of this vulnerability in the wild was first noticed in Japan and other Asian countries before it hit Europe and US. In the June Microsoft Patch Tuesday, Microsoft acknowledged fixing two zero-day vulnerabilities, and one of them was in the XML Core Services. The XML Core Services is a set of services that allows developers to build Windows-native XML-based applications. The vulnerability was in the getDefinition function, as a value of a variant or, in certain cases, is left uninitialized. This uninitialized value could be dereferenced as an object pointer and could be used to execute arbitrary code. A fully working exploit was uploaded on a text-sharing website pastebin.com on 8 June, four days before Microsoft issued the security advisory. Microsoft, in this case, issued an out-of-band fix-it. The fix-it blocks the attack vector to mitigate the vulnerability till a proper patch can be developed and deployed. The initial attack reports of this vulnerability were limited targeted attacks. However, Google had, in the beginning of June, issued warnings to its customers against state-sponsored attacks aimed at compromising user accounts. This warning was later linked to the MSXML zero-day vulnerability. In the same update, Microsoft fixed another vulnerability, which was reportedly being exploited in the wild. This vulnerability was in Internet Explorer and affected all supported versions of IE. This vulnerability was first discovered by McAfee as being exploited in the wild, and Microsoft was quick to fix it in its June update. The root problem of the vulnerability was a use-after-free error within mshtml.dll when handling certain elements having the same ID property. Some reports indicated that certain Hong Kong-based websites were compromised with iframes injected into them. These iframes then served the exploit code from sites based in Russia. Exciting reports, but this brings us to the end of this quarter's zero-day report analysis. This is definitely a step over the previous quarter's zero-day report analysis, which only consisted of one cross-site scripting vulnerability in Adobe Flash Player. Moving on to the next section, 
which could be argued as the most important part of the research cast. Here, we'll discuss the most interesting vulnerabilities reported in the past quarter. This, of course, excludes the zero days that were just discussed. PHP is one of the most commonly used web development languages and has had its own fair share of vulnerabilities. This vulnerability is interesting both technically and in the way that it was handled. In the first week of May 2012, a Dutch group disclosed a vulnerability in PHP CGI. This vulnerability was found by them during the CTF competition and was under coordination with the vendor. However, the bug was accidentally marked as public on PHP's bug tracker and this forced the Dutch group to disclose details on the issue. The problem is in the PHP CGI binary when parsing query string parameters. The applications that use PHP CGI wrapper pass the query string parameters to the binary, which does not properly escape some parameters, and those are interpreted as command line arguments. This leads to an attacker being able to execute arbitrary commands on, on a vulnerable system. This is an interesting vulnerability, as it's fairly simple to exploit when running under a specific configuration. The twist comes in when PHP developers issued a fix for this vulnerability. The developers missed out some variants of the issue and it took them a couple of versions and a few CVE IDs to finally fix the flaw. Around the same time the PHP CGI vulnerability was being discussed, reports of another vulnerability started doing rounds on Twitter. This vulnerability also affected installations that run PHP CGI. The Apache request headers function copies the name of an environment variable into a 128-byte buffer. However, instead of stopping after copying the name, it continues to read the entire environment variable, which results into a buffer overflow if a long string is sent. The interesting thing about this vulnerability was that even though it was not marked as public and details were unknown, the title of the bug remained public. The title was enough to give out information about the nature of the vulnerability and the affected function. Soon, it was heavily under discussion on Twitter and PHP was quick to issue a fix for this. We usually hear researchers complaining about how painful the vulnerability coordination process is when dealing with a vendor, especially if there are more than one vendors involved. However, there was recently a really nice example where a vulnerability that affected at least five different vendors were really nicely coordinated. Patches for the vulnerability were released in unison and care was taken that the details of the vulnerability are not released by any vendor till all the vendor's customers had sufficient time to patch their systems. The vulnerability was in a way certain operating systems and virtualization software implement AMD's SysRed instruction. Operating systems and applications that were written as per AMD specifications but run on Intel CPUs are affected. An unprivileged user or a ring 3 user could execute code as ring 0 or in kernel mode and could gain escalated privileges. The sysred instruction only saves and stores the RIP or return instruction pointer of the guest. Additionally, when the addressing scheme does not fit the specified range, a general protection fault is thrown. The problem is that sysred instruction does not restore the return stack pointer and expects the hypervisor to do so. This means that by the time the general protection fault happens, the hypervisor stores the guest's RSP along with all the other general purpose registers. Hence, if the hypervisor can be induced to have a non-canonical RIP to return to, the RSP can be set to an arbitrary value and can be exploited to gain escalated privileges. In the second week of June, a vulnerability was disclosed in MySQL and MariaDB, which generated quite a buzz in the security community. It was reported that an attacker with no knowledge of the database password could connect to the database. During the authentication process, a hash of the password is generated and compared with the expected value. However, due to an incorrect casting issue, the values might be considered equal even if they're not. This results in MySQL or MariaDB considering the values as correct. The hash generation protocol uses a random string 
and therefore the probability of exploiting this issue is 1 out of 256 times. However, if an attack is automated, then this could only take a split second. The good news is that the binary versions are not affected and only systems compiled using Linux glibc are affected. Now, to talk about some interesting vulnerabilities fixed in Microsoft's Patch Tuesday. Of all the bulletins that Microsoft has issued till now, the one that stands out is MS-12034. This was a combined security bulletin which fixed 10 vulnerabilities in various applications. This bulletin was interesting for many reasons, one of them being that Microsoft fixed a variant of a vulnerability that was exploited by the Dooku malware. CVE 2011-3402, which was fixed in December last year, was a zero-day vulnerability in the Windows kernel which existed, which existed in the parsing of two type fonts. This vulnerability was discovered to be actively exploited in the wild by a malware codenamed Dooku. In their May patch release, Microsoft acknowledged fixing the same code base that also existed in various other applications, namely .NET Framework, MS Office, Silverlight, and Link. Microsoft, however, stated that the vulnerability could not be leveraged by known attack vectors in the mentioned products, but the code existed in them and they wanted to address the vulnerable code across all Microsoft code base. There were other vulnerabilities addressed in this update. Some of them affected multiple products and hence, rather than issuing multiple individual bulletins for each product, Microsoft, in this rare case, decided to issue a combined bulletin. While talking about MS-12034, it's also worth mentioning that in that update, Microsoft fixed a privilege escalation vulnerability in the Windows kernel. The vulnerability existed when handling keyboard layout files. The keyboard layout files allow a user to select different keyboard formats, example, changing the input language. A boundary error exists within the read layout file function, which is responsible for parsing layout files. This could result in a heap-based buffer overflow, which could be exploited to gain escalated privileges. While Microsoft fixed this vulnerability properly, they failed to notice another vulnerable function in the same library. A function within the kbdus.dll library is vulnerable to memory corruption, which could also be exploited to gain escalated privileges. This vulnerability was publicly disclosed on some exploit databases and a proof of concept was also available. The vulnerability is still unpatched and Microsoft should fix this in the near future. In our previous webcast, we discussed an unauthenticated remote code execution vulnerability in the remote desktop protocol which, could, which gathered some headlines due to a leaked POC. In the June update, Microsoft fixed yet another unauthenticated remote code execution vulnerability in RDP. The cause of the vulnerability is an error when handling certain objects. Details of the vulnerability are not yet known and it appears to have been found internally by Microsoft. Applications written in the .NET framework are considered safe against certain vulnerability classes, example buffer overflows and memory corruption. The framework, however, itself is susceptible to these vulnerabilities. One such vulnerability was fixed in the .NET CLR or the Common Language Runtime. The vulnerability existed in a function in the Graphics Path Iterator class. This class provides functionality to call native functions of the GDI Plus library. The vulnerable function did not validate parameters passed to it. This resulted in certain memory being corrupted, which could be exploited to execute arbitrary code. Last week, Sikunia launched its latest product, PSI, or Personal Software Inspector version 3.0 for its home users. PSI is a great free tool that identifies vulnerabilities in third-party programs and helps users protect their systems. It assesses the security patch state of the software on your system and constantly monitors your system for insecure software installations. It also notifies you when an insecure application is installed and provides you with detailed instructions of updating the application when a patch is available. The PSI is released in five languages, so there's no excuse not to install it. This tool is highly recommended for home users, and we of course have the CSI or Corp 
Corporate Software Inspector for corporate users. The Sikunia Vulnerability Coordination Reward Program, as you may know, is a new offering by Sikunia, which allows vulnerability researchers to coordinate vulnerabilities via Sikunia and in return get a chance to win some prizes, including a chance to visit a security conference of their choice plus a paid hotel stay. Some of the prizes are really cool and I wish I were eligible to win some of them. In April, we awarded IDA standard licenses to four researchers for the detailed and high quality reports that, they, that were reported to us for Windows applications. Additionally, our 2011 winners for the SVCRP program, that is Tai Li Wong and Parvez Anwar, will be going to Black Hat Las Vegas in July to attend the conference. Moreover, they will be staying at none other than Caesars Palace, which is all sponsored by Sikunia. We will be announcing our winners for the year 2012 in December, and that gives you about 6 months more to find and report some awesome vulnerabilities. Via the SVCRP program, we make the coordination process very interactive by providing detailed feedback and analysis about the vulnerabilities, which also makes it very interesting for the researchers reporting the issues. This brings us to the end of this quarter's research cast. If you have enjoyed watching the research cast and have some comments or would like to hear about other interesting things, then please do write in to us at vol at sikunia.com. Thank you for joining us today. This is Chetanya Sharma signing off. Goodbye.